Hi everyone, welcome to today's, this month's uh, Wednesday Wisdom Session. Uh, these are peer learning sessions where uh, incubator practitioners and practitioners in the field, experts in the field share best practices and their expertise with uh, uh, all the other incubators in this area. Um, my name is Arun Venkatesan. Uh, I'm a co-founder and CEO of Wilgro USA. Um, you are now being participating in our incubating incubators uh, program uh, where we hope to build uh, and support and enable a global network of social enterprise incubators. Um, for those of you who don't know about Wilgro, Wilgro started out in India and uh, we are hubs in four places uh, in Kenya, Wilgro Africa, is based in Kenya, it serves all of Africa. Wilgro Philippines uh, serves all of Southeast Asia. Uh, Wilgro India, of course, serves the Indian subcontinent in South Asia. And uh, I'm based in the US. Uh, Wilgro US uh, is an overarching umbrella organization that helps integrate the activities of the hubs and also supports them in uh, quite uh, a few of the common activities. Um, together, we have uh, incubated more than 350 enterprises over 20 years, um, um, deployed a lot of seed funding, leveraged about 10, uh, 10x uh, in follow-on funding, and have about 40 million lives impacted. Hold on, my... Uh, so our mission is to help impactful uh, incubators succeed and scale. And we do that across three pillars of activities, Inspire, where we share our stories, uh, and our successes and, and, and opportunities about uh, social entrepreneurship and supporting them. Incubate, which is the core activity now where we support and uh, uh, assist member incubators with a lot of uh, their needs by training, by capacitating, et cetera. And invest pillar where we are hoping to build a fund of incubators through various other in instruments and more on that as we uh, develop and it's, it's sort of early stages for that. So our vision is to scale our impact by building this network of impact incubators that's global. Uh, and we wanna be the go-to network for change agents in this space. Change agents like you, uh, impact incubators, donors, uh, policy makers, entrepreneurs, innovators, and mentors. Uh, we offer about, about six services for our network members. You know, we have codified, we've recorded all our uh, best practices and replication guides and templates. We offer training sessions and hands-on training as part of our uh, 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 incubating incubators training programs. We also give guest access to Vitals, our MIS incubation management system that we have developed and it's a cloud-based tool. Um, we've, we do peer learning sessions like these, um, open to the community of impact incubators and also a special sessions as part of our training programs. We have individual hand-holding sessions where we individually in, uh, uh, on in-person, sorry, one-on-one -on -one, um, train and mentor incubators and help them with their issues. Uh, networks uh, and with forums to connect and discuss for our members. Of course, I talked about capacity building funding and incubators, uh, fund of incubators, that we, that's a work in progress. So there are two ways to participate in the activities and be part of our uh, um, um, offerings. One is be a community member. With the Impact Community Membership, it's entirely online. All the resources available to you uh, are through a free membership. Um, please go look at our website and there's a, there's a simple two, three step uh, registration and it's done. You have uh, access to our replication guide um, and access to past recordings of peer learning sessions. And of course, you get invited to all our live sessions in future. Of course, if you want a slightly deeper involvement, slightly deeper help, we can, you can be part of our intense incubation training program. We have customized handholding mentoring sessions as part of that. And you also have access to network forums and uh, forums and connection with other members. Eventually we would explore joint funding opportunities, co-investment, co-incubation with partner members. Uh, we also have Vitals, this is basically our, um, uh, knowledge management, management information system specific to the incubation process and workflow. It's a cloud-based tool that uh, is quite effective in managing your entire portfolio, entire workflow of incubation from application to exit. 
very data driven and it uh, surfaces information um, you know uh, to through various reports and dashboards and makes the incubation process uh, whether you are a smaller incubator or a large or managing a large portfolio very very seamless and effective um, talk to us send us um, uh, inquiries if you are interested in that custom installations um, uh, services are available um, so at any time you can always reach out to us with questions with more information either through email or any one of our social media handles i want to um, um, open up the floor to our guest speaker of the day um, Deb Streeter, uh, professor and practitioner, I want to stress this, uh, at, at Cornell University. So I, I came to uh, know uh, Deb through uh, um, a sort of a shared course we participated in. Deb, Deb was an instructor. It's a GIST course run by Venture Well for uh, Bhutanese entrepreneurs. And um, it was very quite, quite impressive the way her uh, uh, material was structured and she approached so naturally i hit her up to be part of our wednesday recent sessions uh, deborah is unique in the sense that she practices what she preaches so preaches what she practices both ways uh, she started out by designing a women's entrepreneurship course at uh, cornell um, and uh, eventually launched whatever uh, resources and efforts uh, she put together, whatever material came out of that uh, as first Eclipse and then as a, as a startup, Prendismo, which is still going strong. I, I'll let her talk about this. But what's unique was uh, what started out as a pilot, I would say, uh, with a target of training about uh, um, 5,000 um, uh, women entrepreneurs through a course over two, three years. Um, or five years, I don't, I don't remember. She'll probably clarify that. Turned out to be 50,000 women entrepreneurs who have graduated from this course. So that's, you know, what I call quality and quantity, amazing numbers. Uh, so I thought uh, since a lot of the incubators in our network are uh, trying to cater to and empower women entrepreneurs, uh, we should definitely hear her wisdom and her experience and her insights on this. So today she's going to talk about how impact incubators can better support uh, women entrepreneurs. I won't take any much more of her time. She has a lot of experience to share. So Deb, the floor is yours. Please enlighten us uh, with your insights. Great. And thanks for everyone who's um, on the call today. Um, I always like to give a little context about who I am, and thank you for that um, very generous intro. Um, so I have on the left-hand side of this slide a few of the things that describe me as a professional. Um, I spent 35 years as a faculty member at Cornell University in the College of Business. And um, recently, I moved into what I call I don't call it retirement, I call it preferment. I just do what I prefer. And one of the things that I really love doing is continuing to teach and work with entrepreneurial teams, um, many of whom are part of incubators. So uh, I, I have experience in this country about that. Um, I'm, I participate in a program here in the US that's um, put on by the National Science Foundation. We work with teams who have technology-based businesses. Um, and then, uh, as was mentioned, I started my own company in 2008 based on some ed techno education technology that I created way back when. Um, we actually just had our exit this year, so that was very exciting. And then most recently, I'm the faculty director for the Bank of America Institute for Women's Entrepreneurship. And that's been a really interesting experience. Um, Bank of America gave a gift to Cornell to develop a completely online curriculum that would be free to entrepreneurs um, who are in the zero to five year 
uh, range in terms of starting their business. And this was uh, what was referred to. We started out thinking, well, you know, where are we going to get all the women for this program? But as soon as it opened, we were overrun by demand. So we went in the last, uh, by next spring, we will have graduated, uh, uh, sorry, not graduated. We will have enrolled 50,000 women. And this curriculum, which is free, um, includes the courses like creating your venture, a course on legal issues, a course on financial issues, leadership, product development, and the final course is, is really looking at all the types of negotiation and persuasiveness that you need as an entrepreneur. Um, it's been a really whirlwind of a trip because as you can imagine scaling, if you scale businesses, that's uh, going from five to 50, when you thought you were gonna have support for 5,000 and you ended up having to support 50. Um, these are courses that are completely online um, built by Cornell faculty, and each of the courses runs for two weeks at a time and has a human facilitator. Um, so that's, you know, that's a very unique thing. Um, one caveat I want to um, say, uh, we would welcome, and we have participants from all over the world, but right now we have 30,000 people on a wait list. So if you refer other people to the program, which would be wonderful, um, just tell them, you know, you're not going to get in at the first beat. Um, so I always like to add that. Um, today, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, things in the context of women. And sometimes I think, you know, all entrepreneurs face challenges. Maybe we want to start with, you know, how are how is this different for women? And I want to be very respectful to the fact that I don't have experience in your context. So I'm going to be asking some questions um, to pull out, you know, I'm going to share some of the experiences I've had over time. Um, we started hearing, there's lots of research and data on, you know, female entrepreneurs and what, you know, what they encounter. But this is a quote from one of our participants who said, you know, I'm making progress, right? I'm getting invited to CEO dinners and so forth. But then when I'm there, they say, treat me as if I'm one of the serve, you know, I'm serving the food, um, even though it's clear that I'm a participant. So, this desire to sort of step into the spotlight and be seen as an entrepreneur um, has been difficult for a lot of the women in our program. I'm wondering if you would participate in a poll, if you've got a cell phone or you can do this on your computer. We'll see um, what, how, how much similarity there is. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some similarity and some some differences, but this gives me a sense. So we see uh, credibility and access to funding is usually really good, career conflict, responsibilities perhaps that they have at home, um, knowledge base, uh, you know, mindset is a big one. And say your answers uh, kind of fit into <clears throat> You know, if we think about entrepreneurs and all the people that act in the ecosystem that entrepreneurs live in, um, there are lots, of, I'm not going to go through all the details on this slide, but there are lots of places in the ecosystem, and I added incubators because I didn't see them in the support structure on this slide. There are lots of places that here in the U.S. anyway, that women run into issues. So, it can be wheat, for example, starting in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, we have fewer women in entrepreneurial education. Um, their women's networks tend to be uh, not as strong as men's networks. Um, there are barriers really at every turn here. There, there's not as much leadership. There's not as much diversity in leadership. 
you pointed out that there's access to capital issues. It was the first thing that came up. Um, not enough role models and these societal norms of what is considered okay. So we see there are a lot of sort of structural things that women run into. So issues facing women entrepreneurs, there are internal things, things that they can learn, um, things that they can do. And I'm going to talk about some of the things that you can help them with. But we have to acknowledge there are also a lot of external factors in the system. And, you know, really those are things that only people who are in power can fix. So we have to make sure we're not, it's not all about fixing the women. We, we want to make sure that we have a, a broader sense of things. So, Aaron, I don't know. I came up with basically five themes. Do you want me to just go forward presenting them or you want to? Oh, yes, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. You have All enough right. material that I shouldn't talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I think one of the very first things is to help the women in your programs understand that they are going to have to navigate what's called the double bind. And that is the choice between being perceived as nice or competent. And as it turns out, you know, both women and men expect women to be nice. The problem is if we look at, uh, this is from catalyst.org. If you're looking for um, materials on women in entrepreneurship and leadership, uh, Catalyst is a great place to get data, ideas, frameworks, and so forth. The idea is our gender stereotypes, and this could be, you know, the stereotypes might vary quite a bit from culture to culture and country to country and so forth. But the leaders in general need to take charge and take care, right? A really good leader knows how to do those things that require strength and decisiveness and assertiveness. And also there's an aspect of leadership that involves being nurturing and responding emotionally and being communicative. The problem that um, we run into is the stereotype is that men take charge and women take care, even though we know in entrepreneurial leadership, they need both. But when women exhibit take charge characteristics, they might be seen as competent, but they're disliked by both women and men. When women take care, they're liked, but it takes away from the, the image of power that they need. So you get stuck navigating in between these two things. And I'd be curious to know if, if you feel that's true uh, for the women in your, um, do you want to add anything to that, Aaron, or does anybody have any questions on this? Sometimes for, for both women and men, who are in incubator programs, understanding there this double bind exists is really important because, um, you, you know, as of, let's say you're a very assertive female, you have to be ready for pushback you may get from, uh, from various people. It could be people in the funding world, um, I see Shiresh says our experience has not been the same. We see them as equal, which is amazing. I think that's really, really great. Um, and uh, Nang say, saying I see that a lot in Asian culture. Um, so it's, it's interesting um, to know if you start paying attention to this, you might not have seen it yet. And you yourself might be treating people equally. But the, the system as a whole, there are resistances, there are barriers to women becoming extremely assertive um, and also being perceived as, as, as likable. And that's just something women run into and have to figure out. Um, the second thing I thought of and Aaron told me to, do, to think of five, so I have five plus a couple of other ideas, is I think 
Um, I, I'm imagining that many of you focus on customer discovery in the um, here in many of the programs I teach in are lean startup oriented and we really focus on having people talk directly to their customers because that takes them to focusing on a problem solution fit um, rather than a uh, rather than a really innovation focus. Um, in order to get to product market fit, you really need to understand the problem that you're solving. And one of the research findings um, that's out there is, in, in the, again, this is a US-based uh, phenomenon, and I hope it's not the same for you, but here, women are judged on the evidence of their achievements, whereas men are judged more on the promise that they might have. And if you think about that in an entrepreneurial setting, that's problematic for women in startups because they're just at the beginning stages. They don't have evidence where, you know, in a pitch setting, they are expected to show more evidence of their competence. And so this question of having good data to show um, and, and to, re, to emphasize the idea that, you know, in entrepreneurship, and I learned this myself in a very painful way with my own company, you know, it's just not about you and your innovation. It's about your customer and their problem. How does it impact the way that your customer does their jobs? You know, and how urgent is that problem? How severe is that problem? How desperate is the um, customer for a solution to that problem? And what would it take for them to consider a new option? Humans, and I think this is a human trait, um, you know, just don't like to change. And so getting them to change requires you to really understand the problem. There's a question here, um, about whether I'm suggesting that we should help women create more evidence as opposed to male entrepreneurs. I think all of your entrepreneurs need evidence, but the women especially need to know how to use it, how to get it, how to do customer discovery and how to present it because their credibility and um, in the word cloud, you didn't see somebody mentioned, credibility is an issue for women in, in that person's setting. Now, women have different lived experiences, if you will. And so they're gonna come up with different hypotheses about problems. And those hypotheses, they can be tested in this customer discovery. So I think customer discovery is really important for everybody. You really need to, um, you really need to focus them on, you know, understanding the problem solution fit. And, but maybe perhaps even more so for women. I think another thing, and this is a little bit controversial and could even be seen a little bit as a little bit um, sexist, if you will, that, but the research is that as a group, women have score higher levels of emotional intelligence. The world, the world you grow up in as a woman expects you to um, be tuned in to other people. And that's very helpful. That's a strength for women entrepreneurs when it comes to um, startup issues, right? And so I'm sure in your incubators, um, and I'm sure in, in, in your incubators, you have observed the way that people issues can um, sideline companies. So uh, I've often heard people say, you know, cash flow is king, and you know, it's all about cash flow. Um, but I've always thought like people issues are really right up there, right? Because if you have the right people, you can solve the cash flow issue. But if you have good cash flow and really severe people issues, you know, it's hard to get around that. Some of the people issues could be when you're recruiting other people to join your team, 
um, motivating people who may not be uh, able to access the benefits of, of being on the leadership team. There's always a question of egos. Um, I don't know if the companies that come into your businesses or into your incubators um, get involved in equity splits, but that is something I've seen over my three decades plus of working with teams. Um, figuring out how that works, what's fair, what's motivating and so forth with equity splits. And then during growth, you know, grow, growing a company from a small um, <clears throat> entity that has only a few people, as opposed to, you know, a growth-based team, there's a lot of chemistry, there's a lot of human chemistry. So I would encourage women to, you know, take advantage of if they do have a strong um, emotional intelligence, that that's something that can be a real positive. I think the other thing, and again, this, is, this could be very cultural, and I apologize if it's not relevant for you, but growing up female in the United States, you are <clears throat> often not e exposed to as much um, on the financial side and getting comfortable with money issues is really, really important because you have to learn how to negotiate and operate with all kinds of financial kind of options. Um, get comfortable with talking about money, with thinking about money, with understanding how, how your business is gonna go. And this could be as something as simple as you're running a nail salon or a beauty product all the way up to you have a, you know, some kind of Bitcoin strategy. Um, everybody needs to know how to manage cash. And that's, that's something that um, you want to strengthen for anybody in your program that is, ha, has not grown up comfortable thinking about and talking about money. The other thing for women is typically, you know, there are lots of negotiating courses that teach principles that, that will work for women, but really negotiating kind of like a man, it often won't work for women because of the pushback from the double bind. If they're seen as too aggressive, or more likely to be seen as greedy in a negotiating setting, that can be very problem problematic. Um, and then number five, I just think creating some spaces and cultures that are more inclusive. And this could be anything from like, what does your space look like? Is it filled with, uh, I went into an incubator in New York City one time and it had like all these like, basketball sports heroes on the walls and it had all these like affirmation statements that were I just don't think would necessarily resonate with everyone um, not necessarily just women but you know the everything was drawn for, from sort of the majority culture uh, another thing and I'm sure that that you uh, all of you have uh, tried to help with this is Women need more role models because there are fewer out there for us. Um, and the visual cue, the dialogue among members, you know, is it, if, is it an environment that is inclusive? Um, I think those are things that are really important. Um, you can think about, you know, whether the vibration in your place is really competitive and aggressive, which would be appropriate for incubators that are trying to encourage but also you want to have, I, I bet this is true for you since a lot of your social enterprise is, a lot of your work is in the social enterprise space. Is it collaborative and, and open to sharing? You know, the photos and the art that might be there, um, even the sculptures or whatever you have in your area. And who people see in leadership. Is everybody the same or do they see different types of people in leadership? Um, a big one is women are very, according to research, women are successful at networking peer to peer. That's really not an issue. The place where they have trouble, if they're in an environment where the 
peer to above network where mostly in the case of the US, it would be white males are in the leadership, it's harder to um, have access to those networks and mentors. Um, and since the poll is not really working, maybe this is something that uh, you could have people unmute and talk about, but I'm, interesting to, I'm interested to see what has worked in your settings to support uh, female entrepreneurs. So maybe we'll take a pause there and maybe people can either put in chat think, or you can. I think we should do chat. Yeah, talking okay. would be tough because there's so many people. So get your chat fingers going and um, we will read out stuff in the chat. That would be better. Okay. So Deborah, maybe you want to um, explain. Uh, so, okay, good. I think Chad is picking up. I wasn't sure if they yeah. understood the question. So the real question is, you know, in your programs, um, and perhaps you have mostly female or many females or an equal number of females, what are you seeing that you need to put in place to encourage and support them? <laughs> Uh, so if I may speak, uh, one thing we do at T-Hub is that we make sure that we don't uh, distinguish between the founder gender, whether it's male, female. Sometimes we have a combination of the two. Uh, we don't look at them any differently from any of the other founder sets that are there from the uh, program participants. Uh, second thing is we also talk about entrepreneurship mindset, which is basically which I have a set of 15 aspects that we talk about, which have no connection to gender. So that I think uh, and we ask examples from all of them to share in terms of their experiences. So then that puts the comfort factor that, okay, I'm an entrepreneur. My gender is just incident. I think these two play a big role for us. Thank you. That's, that's, uh, that sounds like a great setting. The, the problem could arise that when they leave your environment, do you feel that they will have the same gender-free experience from the outside world when they go to get funding, when they go to make partnerships? Do you think there's any difference um, for them outside your safe space? Yeah, interestingly, we find that the support system is much better for women founders because mm. there is a positive inclination to funding because they are, I mean, at least in Indian context, they're seen as uh, better money managers in sense of, you know, managing their expenses uh, meaningfully. Because in Indian environment, most of the women have grown up seeing their mothers, grandmothers, seeing, managing the household expenses where fathers just come and give them salary to the woman and then they take care of it. So that may be the cultural difference that where yeah. women are actually quite comfortable managing the expenses and the and for investors also see that the typical response we get is that women may be a lot more careful in spending the money where men tend to be very carefree and then burn the investments much faster than women. Great. So already you have said that, that, you know, in this case, it works to the advantage of women. Um, but there, there are, it sounds like there are some differences. Yeah. So I also see a lot of uh, other as enabling aspects being listed uh, in the chat. Um, so I, I, you know, there's quite a bit of um, things like peer learning, mentoring. I think um, uh, having female mentors uh, is something else I see. And then uh, creating a safe space. These are all aspects you were touching upon, Deborah, in the talk. Um, okay. I wanted to bring up one point. Um, so initially, uh, I, I was listening to Suresh, and um, I think I, I sensed this, right? If you ask the question, do you treat uh, uh, male and female entrepreneurs differently? I would have answered no. Uh, why should I even do that? I never have that lens. But then on discussion, after discussion, some research and talking to the team, I realized that there are some characteristics that I need to be sensitive to, and there are some systemic 
um, discrepancies, let's say, in the way women entrepreneurs are, uh, you know, handled in the ecosystem. And I think that when I started becoming sensitive to those, I started observing them and I started, uh, say, compensating. I don't know, in my own approach and all that. So could you talk to how you can spot these differences, even though our lenses might be quite neutral, right? Um, yeah. Uh, but there are some systemic, the way we have set it up. I'll, I'll start with, lead with one uh, point that you had raised. In your own organization's um, leadership, right? You may, you, may, you may have the attitude internally of equality, but uh, um, what, the, what you're communicating to others is, you know, look at your own leadership sometimes. We actually some, had to take a conscious look at our, leadership or composition or, you know, and then make sure, I mean, we weren't biased, we weren't skewed in one way or the other, but we had to put that lens on and look at it, right? The message we are sending in the leader with, with the composition of the leadership, etc. So like that, I'm sure you've observed quite a few of these signaling factors, right? That you, I think you mentioned in, in the previous slide also. So maybe we can spend, maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. I'm not sure quite where you're going with that, but I guess one thing that I would say, because I see a little bit of pushback in the chat about how like, you know, it's, it's, it's maybe not as much of an issue as, as I'm putting it out there, but I don't know what the data is in your area, but um, in the U S on every measure, um, amount of funding, access to capital, and so forth, women are not doing as well as men. So something is happening. <laughs> These, th there are some external issues that are impacting women. I think to, to answer your question, Aaron, like how do you, I think what you're asking me is how do you tell what's happening? I would just say, you know, have kind of discussions, open discussions with women in the programs in a safe space where they're not, you know, going to be perceived as criticizing the men who are in the room mm -hmm. about what, what they're encountering on the outside. Like when do they, when do they run into issues where they, they feel they're getting pushed back as women? I think, I mean, I that's, think that's, that's that, that's great feedback, right? Um, for example, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be provocative here, right? And if you look at the chat, um, I think I'm sure there is a gender bias in the kind of comments also, not gender bias, but uh, <laughs> the, the women in the chat are probably saying that, you know, you need safer space, you need neutrality is not equality, et cetera, et cetera. And probably the men are saying, I mean, I'm not saying that I'm not stereotyping here, but I'm saying in the, in perceptions of equity, equality, even there is a gender bias, right? So I think that's what I was trying to get to is to, as you rightly said, create a space, a safe space, and actually um, uh, find out from the women entrepreneurs if they are facing those things. All right. So I'm going to... I mean, I, I, I'd like to respond to, do you have a set of questions you can put? To get their feelings, I, I'd be most interested in their experiences and maybe not even starting that conversation with a gender lens, but asking, you know, where do they see the biggest barriers to succeeding? And then they might say, well, I'm trying to take care of my senior parents. Um, it's a pandemic, so I'm having to educate my children at home. And you can follow with a question, do you think that burden falls more on women than men as a way of understanding, you know, I think all of us are kind of trapped in a way by our own lived experience. And we, we are good people. We don't want to think that we have had, have expressed bias, but when you have to kind of step into the lived experience of other people, and by the way, everyone um, has layers of identity. It's not just gender. It can be race. It can be uh, religion. It can be, um, you know, 
sexual preference, whatever, it, it can be a mixture of all these levels of all the identities we have. And women sometimes are like, is it because I'm young? Is it because I'm from the South? Is it because I'm this? And, and so it, it can be very complicated to sort out what is affecting you. Um, I think this comment by Basil, uh, by Paul is, is very interesting. If, if a woman comes into the incubator, should she say that she's pregnant because she might not get picked for the program? Could that be avoided? Um, you know, I, I think that's a difficulty women uh, face a lot. I remember um, in my first job interview, I was five months pregnant and I thought it was quite obvious, but uh, the person got, I didn't think I was going to get the job and I got closer to realizing they were going to offer me the job. And I'm like, should I say that I'm pregnant or not? And I think that was many, many years ago. And I think um, that could happen today is that it could possibly affect selection and you wanna make sure that you're not putting out criteria of commitment that would be difficult for women to make um, given the other demands on their lives. So are we out of time? I see the poll coming up. Sorry, sorry we have about eight to 10 minutes left. So okay. we do have time. Um, um, any other questions? I mean, I, I see Paul typing that even women and entrepreneurs have this bias uh, in recruiting uh, women and team members. So uh, that's very interesting. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that, you know, women and men, everybody in each of our cultures suffers from some biases. That's a human uh that's a shortcut human brains use, right? We do pattern matching and so forth. It has, you have to just have an awareness of when this can be, a, you know, really a, a barrier for people. Um, I, some other ideas I had were, um, let me see if I can move the poll. Okay. Um, just keeping, taking a look at your own leadership. Do you have female voices um, that can help raise the, the awareness of any issues women might be running into. Um, one area of get, getting and giving feedback between men and women, um, we're raised differently when it comes to feedback. Uh, that might be something to explore. Just do as much presentation of role models as you possibly can. Um, and I see a question Oh, interesting. So when you have uh, a husband-wife team, uh, Suresh is saying, you know, sometimes the women are more subdued in discussions. And then you, you, you know, you have to figure out, is there a, you know, what is the role they're both playing in the company, asking questions that could draw out the expertise. You can have a side conversation with them. Maybe it's a comfortable place for them. Maybe um, that is true of two ma male entrepreneurs as well, right? Think about sometimes it is about gender and sometimes it's not. But I would say anything you can encourage to bring out the voice of, of players, whether they're male or female, um, to make sure that you're learning the most you can about the company and, and, and so forth. That would be really good. All right, I think comments, uh, uh, questions are dying down. Um, maybe you can go back to the, uh, the, the points you were making on uh, about uh, the other ideas that you had. Um, meanwhile, if there is, uh, if you have a burning question, we have about a couple of minutes to ask that. So put that, put that in the chat. Um, I, 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 I wanted to ask about, um, so there was a comment about equity. Neutrality is not equity. So you said strive for diversity inclusion, both are okay. 
Uh, but what are some good uh, uh, measures you've seen other organization take uh, for equity, right? Uh, some proactive measures that you've seen other organization take. Uh, also, you might you must have uh, listened to your uh, course participants and other women entrepreneurs who said, "Hey, these things really helped us. Uh, you know, g gave us a sense of equity in the system." Uh, can you share a couple of those in the few minutes we have? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think oftentimes when we are thinking about diversity, we start by saying, oh, yeah, we, want, we need to have men and women involved. And then we, you know, sort of, we grew into the idea that just because women are, just because you might have one or two females, they, they might not necessarily feel included. And then all the way to the equity point is, you asked about measures of equity. I would just look at the very simple things of like, are women um, staying in your programs? Are they completing your programs? Are they getting funding when they leave? Is there any differential in the level of success they're seeing once they graduate from your programs? Um, one of the things that has happened in the past in the U.S. in incubator programs is they lead to some funding um, environments. And I've had more than, more than a couple of women, young women, say when it came to funding, there was a lot of... Um, uh, there was a lot of harassment that went on by funders who, uh, you know, saw them as, you know, they were going to take them out to dinner and then maybe they had some expectations that were not made of the men. And I, that may or may not be, I hope it's not true in the environments that you're in. Um, but that's kind of what I meant when we started, like some of these things, we can help women feel confident and Interesting that access to capital seemed to come up a lot and knowledge base. Um, why, I, I'm be, I would be curious to know why people think knowledge, what knowledge is, is kind of missing in, in, uh, for women as opposed to others. Um, and people are, are identifying some barriers. Um, so, it looks to me like this would be very similar to something that you would see here if I asked this question of incubators in the US. Excellent. Um, so I'm glad to share um, a more detailed version of that um, in my final PDF I send you. Yeah, excellent. So I see um, uh, one other thing uh, that Paul had mentioned that the 2x challenge. I encourage everyone to go look at that. It's a, uh, it's a wonderful way to do some uh, introspection and alignment. Uh, that's uh, that's another, another comment in case somebody missed it. In the so um, thank you, Deborah, for spending time with us today, sharing your knowledge. I hope it was as useful to you to hear this global perspective as it was to all our participant members. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you so much. I